o tātou nei oi oi ngā kei rongi i te ipurangi. Ano reira koutou mā, kore i te manu tākiri mai te ata. Ka ao, ka ao, ka awatea, ati e mauriora. Welcome everybody um, and thank you for joining us in this morning's um, Sustainable Seas session. Um, just to give you a, a very brief um, explanation of the introduction I just opened us up with. Um, I just um, expressed a greeting to our Supreme Being from whom the bounty of our um, world and the, the guidance with which to um, look after that bounty comes from. Uh, secondly, um, just an acknowledgement to um, those of our ancestors and our whanau who um, have passed on and no longer able to be with us, um, a, an acknowledgement and recognition to them. Um, then finally, just uh, welcomed you all um, and uh, in a general greeting for joining us this morning. With that explanation underway, I'll just open us up with a short um, karakia uh, and then uh, introduce the, the session. Uh, e whā toro ana te ngākau ki a rātou o te wā ingaro, ki a tau mai nei te manaakitanga ki runga ki tēnei oi oinga. Tā warautia mātou o te kāka u taketake o te manātua o te manaariki, tūtū, tūturu ki a runga waka maua ki a tēna, tēna. Uie, taikie. Kia ora no koutou. So I just wanted to start by, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the meaning of this series of webinars from Sustainable Seas, the title being Te Au o Te Moana. That title or uh, theme for the challenge was introduced to us by Sustainable Seas Komatua Joe Harawira. And it recognises that like each of us, the moana, our oceans, have a distinct voice. And to hear that voice is to understand the state of its well-being. This series of webinars hosted by Sustainable Seas uh, outlines how we are bringing together the knowledge, philosophies and worldviews of Aotearoa New Zealand and beyond to enable us to better hear the voice of our ocean. Right now, I will hand over to Sustainable Seas Director, Julie Hall, to um, introduce today's session in the broader context of the Te Awa Te Moana series. Uh, kia ora koutou. Kia ora koutou, no mai, hairi mai. Um, greetings to you all and welcome. For those who don't know me, I am Julie Hall, the Director of Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. And I would like my, to add my welcome to Linda's to um, the first of, in our webinar series. This is a series of webinars that was, is based on the sessions that were planned for the conference, which we were unable to hold in February due to COVID. There are six webinars um, in this series, and I am having problems. My apologies. Uh, there are six webinars in the series. For the first today, um, next Tuesday, one looking at improved decision making for the Moana, looking at how we might implement ecosystem based management. On Thursday, the 31st, one around healthy seas, looking at um, how we bring our ecological knowledge into decision making. On the 5th, uh, it looks at our blue economy research. Uh, the 8th of April, uh, Hewaka Tauroa, looking at navigating the dual world views to strengthen the voice of the ocean. And then finally on the 12th of April, we'll be looking at how we bring all the research and the challenge together. So that's the synthesis, um, making us greater than the sum of the parts. So today's webinar, Sustainable Seas in the Global Context, has been prepared by the Challenges Independent Science Panel. This is a panel that provides strategic advice on the research we conduct and assists our governance group in assessing the quality and the performance of our research. The presentation will be given by Ian Perry, who is the chair of this group. Ian is an adjunct professor at the University of 
British Columbia in Vancouver, and he is also Emeritus Researcher at Fisheries and Oceans in Canada in Nanaimo. In addition, we have two other members of our independent science panel who will join in for the Q&A, uh, Ingrid Van Putten from Syro in Hobart, and Takani Kingi from Te Whara Wananga Awanui Arangi in Wakatani, and we welcome them as well. Before I hand over to Ian, um, some just a quick housekeeping issues. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A and that can be done anytime throughout the presentation and you will be able to upvote questions that, that you would like to have answered. At the end of the presentation, you will be able to raise your hand electronically um, to ask a, a question. And just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website. So if you would like to share it um, with friends, um, and others in your organisation, you'd be very, very welcome to do that. So I'm going to hand over to Ian. I'm here on audio. I just need to get my video going. There we go. Share my screen. I thought I had done this. There we go. Kia ora koutou. Thank you very much, Julie, for that uh, uh, marvelous introduction. And uh, I certainly am pleased to, to have uh, you all join us this morning for uh, the start of this webinar series. Um, as Julie's mentioned, um, I will be giving the, the main presentation, but I have Ingrid Van Putten uh, and Takani Kingi to help me with the hard questions at the end there. Um, so be sure you think of some hard questions that they can answer for you at the end. I'd also like to just uh, acknowledge the contributions um, of Derek Armitage and Eddie Allison, who unfortunately are not able to join us in the panel this, this morning. At the beginning of uh, the, well, actually the first session that the independent science panel held, the then chair of the governance board, um, Sir Rob, asked us, what does ecosystem-based management look like? In other words, how do we know when we've gotten there? And you have to remember the governance board are a group of, uh, of business leaders, um, um, uh, charity leaders, uh, social leaders in the community, not necessarily scientists per se. And so they were wondering when they first started and, and signed up for the governance board, just, just what does ecosystem-based management look like? Well, it, it turns out that this is a, a really hard question to answer and to answer succinctly. And one of the reasons that it's a hard question to answer is that it's a part of a class of problems which have become known as wicked problems. Wicked problems are those which are resistant to clear solutions. That's in contrast to things that are called tame problems. Uh, I might call them an engineering problem, which are solvable with technical solutions. And basically those technical solutions will apply pretty well everywhere at all times. In contrast, wicked problems arise from multiple issues. They are complex, so there's a lot of nonlinear responses. There's uncertainty and unintended, con un unintended consequences. There's divergence in values and decision-making power. And in particular, there's mismatch in spatial and temporal scales of ecological and human processes. You can see when I go through that and what's on the screen in front of you that that sounds a lot like ecosystem-based management. So there are a number of approaches, of course, for addressing wicked problems. There's a multi-sector decision-making, institution that span the administrative boundaries, adaptive management, and uh, collaborative processes. And so the independent science panel thought about Sir Rob's question a lot. Uh, we debated it. Um, and in the end, we came up with, if I can paraphrase uh, Joseph Campbell, EBM is like an idea with a thousand faces. And we suggested to Sir Rob and the governance board uh, an urban transit and uh, transport analogy. So that the best way to get around a city will differ depending on the city, depending on its characteristics and depending on its constraints. So if you're in Venice, for example, you might take a Vaporetti or a Gondole in order to get around. If you're in Amsterdam, you would certainly use a bicycle, much faster, much more convenient. If you're in London, I would use the tube. I'm sure you would as well. If you're in Delhi, you probably would use a motorcycle or maybe hire a little auto rickshaw, one of these little tuk-tuks. If you're in Los Angeles, you're going to use a car. 
pretty well no way to avoid that. And if you're in Auckland, you probably use the bus. If you're lucky enough to live on one of the islands, Waiheke Island, one of the others, you probably use a ferry. So the idea you, you can perhaps see what I'm trying to build here is that it's the same thing getting around as a city, but depending on where you are and depending on what sort of resources you have available, how you actually get around a city is going to be quite different. You can't say every city you should use a ferry because there are lots of cities without, uh, without ferries as transport systems. So um, what I want to do in this presentation, what we want to do is to talk a little bit about how um, ecosystem-based management programs have developed in a number of different countries around the world, draw out some common elements from those experiences, and then challenge the Sustainable Seas program against those common elements. How does Sustainable Seas compare with these global programs? And I just want to note that the, um, uh, the enthusiasm, I'll use the word, for marine ecosystem-based management really began to develop in the mid-1990s, largely pushed forward by the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, of the United Nations. And uh, it's kind of, it was, it's recognized that one of the first places where much of this was, uh, was published was in the Code for Responsible Fisheries. And a lot of it is, uh, has arisen from the fisheries literature. The problems with fishing, in part, was recognized that uh, fisheries models at the time we're not dealing appropriately with the broader ecosystem. And so this led, in, that was in 1995, this led into in 2000 to FAO to put forward the ecosystem approach to fisheries. And if we step through each of the countries and show now how the selected set of countries have been um, developing this ecosystem approach to not just fisheries, but to marine systems in, in uh, writ large. And I'm going to start at home, at my home. Uh, in Canada. And Canada was an early adopter. Uh, the FAO Code of Contact, uh, Conduct for Responsible Fisheries 1995. We have uh, an Oceans Act, which was prom uh, proclaimed in 1997, calls for wide application of the precautionary approach to conservation and management, calls for development of integrated management plans, which were ecosystem-based, sustainable development, precautionary approach. You see a lot of the common words that we have in EBM concepts today. And the Canadian plan has gone through three phases. The first one was the conceptual development of EBM. The second was when the one then was understanding how Canadian marine ecosystems are structured and how they function. And the third one was integrating environmental processes into formal stock assessments and decision-making frameworks. And we spent quite a bit of time at the beginning, 20 years ago now, um, just asking ourselves what were eco, what should be ecosystem-based management objectives. And you can see the top one there was generally um, agreed to be conservation of species and habitats. And then we tried to drill down a little further. We tried to, we, we uh, developed a set of, of components for biodiversity, a set of components for productivity, and a set of components for preserving physical and chemical properties. And underneath those, we drilled down further to maintain communities, maintain species, maintain populations, et cetera. And for some of these, we were even able to provide um, targets and reference points. The next phase went on, in doing that, we began to realize that we really, in many cases, didn't know enough about how certain ecosystems function. So the next phase involved a series of seven, um, what we called ecosystem research initiatives. They were uh, constructed to understand how Canadian aquatic systems were structured and function, to identify potential EBM priorities, to develop some ecosystem modeling and analysis expertise, to develop new tools. One of the ones uh, we worked on was cumulative effects and to improve comprehensive ecosystem level monitoring assessment and prediction capacities. And the most recent phase has, has gone more towards the, um, I suppose one might say the, the, the kind of core practical species oriented nature of EBM. Uh, and that was integrating, how can we integrate environmental processes into stock assessments? And this is one, one case study example in Newfoundland um, where the intent, intent is to include effects of key ecosystem drivers on, um, in particular here, target species with northern cod. United States, though, took quite a different route. 
um, in the US, uh, the e EBM legislation per se is, is quite scarce. Their National Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act encourages fisheries management councils to develop EBM approaches, but it's not required. And so the, fit, the fisheries management decisions in the US system are made by each of their regional fisheries councils, which has resulted in a rather a patchwork legal framework for EBM in the US. And that left the government agency, the, the NOAA, the, the uh, main agency that's responsible for marine um, affairs in the US in a bit of a quandary because they didn't have a legislative basis or framework within which to put their research. So like being good government employees, good scientists, they developed one. And they developed a system called um, integrated ecosystem assessments. This is a multidisciplinary framework to address me, uh, marine resource management issues. It's a formal and structured analysis of information on natural and socioeconomic factors. And it's in particular a place-based process leading to outcomes of tools and products. Now in, in the US system, um, much more is known about marine ecosystems than is being applied when making management decisions. But this IEA approach uh, helps at least to structure much of that information. On the right hand side is a uh, map of places where these IEAs are being um, developed. On the left hand side is their mandala or their uh, diagram of how this process works, where it basically starts with identifying goals and targets, developing indicators, developing ecosystem assessments, analyzing uncertainty and risk, and then evaluating strategies. And it repeats at multiple different entry points. So in the US, um, much of, and particularly driven by NOAA, much of the um, emphasis has been on developing indicators. An example of, I think, a really nice set of indicators that's been developed by the Puget Sound um, Partnership in Washington State on the west coast of the US is this Puget Sound Vital Signs. Um, you can look at it as I'm discussing here, but they have a number of different high level uh, objectives like water quality, healthy human populations, vibrant human quality of life, thriving species, protected and restored habitat. And what is I think really important and innovative about this system is that they've included both the human and the natural um, indicators in, all, in one, one single, well, not one single, but one in, uh, complex or one set of arrangements of sets of indicators. There's been a number of principles the Americans have developed for indicator um, uh, developing indicators and how to screen them iterative review, and then a balance between evaluation methods and stakeholder guidance. And key indicator development needs that have come out of this process have been engagement tools, how, and in particular, how you transfer this information, and then how you balance scale and trade-offs. And trying to condense um, uh, this complex information to something simple that is understandable by non-scientists and fisheries managers or ecosystem managers is a challenge. The, the holy grail, the goal, is um, to develop something akin to the medical indicators of human health. So the pulse rate, the breath rate, the pallor of the skin. We're, we're certainly not there yet, but we have a much better sense now, I think, of what some of those general indicators might be. In Australia, they also were an early adopter. Um, they developed not, not a legislation in, as in Canada's case, but a policy. Australia's ocean policy in this case of 1998 um, and uh, in, in addition, their Fisheries Management Act provides for some EBM related objectives. The focus is integrated ecosystem based ocean planning and management. It's applied to common, as with the US and national waters, it's applied to Commonwealth waters, which are greater in this case, greater than three nautical miles offshore. And science provides the tools to move from a sectoral base to an integrated focus on ocean governance. And they've, I, I think, in general, um, the Australians um, have developed what might be called a, pra a pragmatic approach. They're balancing human activities and environmental stewardship in a multi-use context. And perhaps the best, and in fact, the earliest example of that is the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. The overarching objective there is to protect the outstanding natural value. Um, and they've taken what we would probably now call a uh, marine spatial planning approach to this, where they uh, have to identify zones for different activities, fishing, tourism, recreation, conservation, et cetera. 
And they've also worked or recognized that there has been traditional use of many of the marine resources on the Great Barrier Reef. And they have worked within and with those um, uh, traditional use, uh, tr traditional users and owner groups in partnership to develop um, uh, management activities and to manage um, traditional uh, use based on cultural lore and in including contemporary science. But these agreements tend to be descriptive documents rather than um, we might say hardcore science, uh, outlining the roles of the traditional owner groups and management rather than facilitating the co-management of indigenous groups, traditional land and sea country. A somewhat a different approach was, has been taken by um, New South Wales in their Marine Estate Management Authority, which was developed in 2013. So it's had the advantage of a lot more thinking for all, and that's gone on since the Great Barrier Reef in the 1980s. And its purpose is to advise on the effective management of uh, New South Wales marine and coastal environments. AIM is healthy coast and healthy seas, recognizes connections between ecosystems, people uh, and terrestrial systems. And the last one uh, there in the blue, the community well-being is central. I, that's an aspect which we're seeing more and more now in the global ecosystem approach, literature and practices. Um, the idea that it's not adequate, it's not sufficient to simply maximize economic benefits. We have to go beyond that and maximize social uh, well and community well-being as well as environmental well-being. And the four steps, five steps there are what you might expect. Um, identifying, first of all, how citizens benefit and what they perceive as the threats from the marine estate, and then evidence-based assessments of those threats and risks, assessing and managing, uh, assessing the, the management settings and evaluating options for addressing those threats, implementing those preferred options, and then establishing accountability via monitoring, measuring, and reporting. And in many ways, you can see this somewhat follows that integrated ecosystem assessment process the Americans have, but I, I sort of like the way this is quite clearly structured. Um, there's a nice paper by uh, Smith et al, which kind of evaluated the Australia's success in implementing EBM. And they concluded that there were a number of things which needed to take place for uh, a successful outcome. And that's that a, a clear need is identified. And in particular, that there is identified owners or ownership of the process. There's early stakeholder engagement, understanding what society is, uh, is expecting. Um, in particular, and I'll come back to this, there's an institutional framework and governance structures within which the whole system can work. There are clear operational objectives and that science is required, but it's not enough. So it's necessary, but not sufficient. And um, again, keeping in keeping perhaps with the pragmatic nature of the approach here, if these key requirements were not developed adequately, the system tended to default to conservation oriented spatial planning, but better than nothing, but you know, maybe not what they had hoped to achieve. <clears throat> in the European Union, there are three uh, legal um, bases for their approach to EBM. One is the marine strategy framework, which aims at achieving good environmental status um, based on a number of um, 11, they call them descriptors, we would call them perhaps indicators. There's a directive on marine spatial planning, which is a developing an ecosystem-based approach for management in a place-based uh, context. And then they have, uh, as a number of countries, ecosystem-based add-ons to the common fisheries policies and the fisheries regulations. Now in the EU, they have, if you like, outsourced a lot of their science and fundamental research to the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, ICES. ICES is the primary North Atlantic organization which is providing the scientific bases for ecosystem-based decisions. And they produce operational products which underpin the, if you like, the exploration of safe operating space for, for trade-offs. They also, as, as similar with the Americans, had developed an integrated ecosystem assessment approach um, and they use a number of tools which are listed there in order to operationalize these integrated ecosystem assessments. And a key part of their approach as well is that they engage with users of the science and advice to identify issues of concern, to understand interests and to bring in other sources of knowledge. An example here on the left is a number of the locations in the North Atlantic. It's a pole view, if, if you find that a bit disorienting. Um, of that they are having the integrated ecosystem assessments. 
And these assessments generally have three main sorts of outputs. They're, they're advice on fishing opportunities. They then present fisheries overviews, and then they kind of roll all those up into broader scale ecosystem overviews. And the last set of um, examples that I want to provide you are, uh, I think, quite interesting because they're a little bit different. And here in these next two slides, we're beginning to see um, the real incorporation of the social side, the traditional indigenous local knowledge side of ecosystem-based management, which has taken quite a while to, to develop, I think, to infuse through the, the, at least the scientific literature. The Arctic Council is a leading forum for cooperation in the Arctic. They have an ecosystem approach to management, which has four aspects to its definition. It's about managing, and this is true throughout all of ecosystem-based management. We're not managing the ecosystem. We are managing human interactions with the ecosystem. So it's about managing human activities. It's based on best available knowledge. So you don't need to know everything in order to be able to do something. The purpose is to make appropriate and effective management decisions. And the goal is to ensure sustainable use while maintaining ecosystem integrity. And you can see these little boxes on the right-hand side here, the specific um, um, references to the needs and objectives of indigenous and local communities, and that indigenous traditional and local knowledge is crucial. And again, that's sort of repeated in the bottom line there with engagement of Arctic uh, indigenous organizations uh, and participatory processes uh, is central to the success of this approach. And back to, I kind of round out maybe our global tour, coming back to the west coast of Canada. Um, the First Nations, particularly on the west coast of Canada, are having some really interesting um, uh, First Nations driven approaches to defining and developing ecosystem-based management in their territories. This is one that the um, Council of Haida Nations and Parks Canada Guayanas uh, National Park Reserve are developing. This is a, a, an area the Council of Haida Nations um, has control over the Haida Gwaii, which are the islands on the upper northwest coast of British Columbia. The map on the left is the southern part of Haida Gwaii, which is the Guayanas National Park Reserve, and shows an example of some of the zones, similar perhaps to the Great Barrier Reef, that are being used for different planning purposes. But the, the reason I bring this up in this context is that this is truly a land, sea, people plan. And it's based on the concept that everything depends on everything else. And I apologize, my, my Haida isn't good enough to be able to, uh, be able to pronounce that um, saying in Haida for you. And it represents integrated management of the land, sea and people, considering the relationships between species and habitats and accounting for short term, long term and cumulative effects of people on the environment. And if you're interested, I suggest you you know, look at that more at uh, length. There's quite a lot of interesting information there. So let me um, try now to bring all that together, to pull out some common elements and to provide some synthesis of what ecosystem-based approaches look like in general uh, around the world. And um, most of the definitions of, e well, while the definitions of EBM can vary in details, most of them include five elements, and they're listed here in the boldface type on the left. So they include some issue or some concept in wrestling with scale, and this tends to be ecologically relevant boundaries in practice. Um, they certainly wrestle with the issue of complexity. Um, these are social ecological systems, lots of nonlinearities and surprises. They include the aspect of the issue of balance, balancing or integrating the needs of multiple human groups and maintaining the health of the underlying system, include collaboration between rights holders, stakeholders uh, involvement. And they have generally now accepted the idea of adaptive management, that there are knowledge uncertainties uh, that will, are inherent to all of these systems, which require monitoring, evaluation, and potential changes in management. So EBM is not only about securing ecosystem services and functions for human benefit, and I might add here, most uh, current thinking is including in that phrase non-human benefit as well, uh, but about ensuring that the costs of doing so and the control access to and benefits from EBM are fairly distributed. So there's a number of steps involved when one comes to implementing marine ecosystem-based management. The first one is that it really is and, and involves developing a holistic marine management regime, a common framework 
for understanding the management challenges and within which to make decisions. This requires delineation of the management area. On top of that is sort of some matchup with the relevant ecological and ecosystem area. Knowledge acquisition, that's actually going out and doing things. Uh, procedures, a system to integrate across sectors. So these are human sectors um, and across right holders and stakeholder interests and, and concerns. Um, a cried, some evaluation criteria. How do you know if the goals of the plan are being reached? Adaptive procedures, adjusting to new knowledge as it comes in. A policy and legal bases. I think I, I keep harping on this, but I think it's really important to provide the framework or the context within which the science is, uh, in, is inserted. And so it's clear who is responsible for making what sorts of decisions and how those decisions are made. And then, of course, management plans, which are the implementation of these policies, legislation, and the strategies. But the application of the ecosystem approach is not intuitive. And uh, on the left, complexities of the coupled natural and human uh, systems and the human-created institutional, legal, and administrative systems make effective implement implementation of EBM complex and challenging. It's difficult to stipulate universal rules for operationalizing EBM because situations and capacities differ. This is back to the, the early slide I showed of the um, definition of a wicked problem. But it's generally accepted that the approach is a good uh, and a reasonable guiding principle for successful management of ecological systems. We are still working out the details, but you know we think this is the way to go. Now, I like this um, particular concept. It's from the reference that's, uh, that's down in the left-hand corner there, because I think it kind of provides, if you like, a, if, and you'll pardon the pun, a concrete example of what we're talking about here, where bricks are necessary, but not sufficient to uh, make progress on EBM, with bricks being the scientific knowledge and other types of knowledge of the region. But, but mortar is also necessary. Mortar as the strength. And mortar is defined as the behaviors, motivations, relationships, commitment, and the shared sense of stewardship of the people involved. And of course, the pictures show without uh, mortar, the bricks fall apart. There's no structure to them. Uh, with mortar, you have a structure which hopefully will be able to withstand the, um, the buffeting of the currents of change and challenge that, that uh, we can expect every year. So let me turn now to the Aotearoa New Zealand Sustainable Seas National Challenge and ask how does that, uh, how does sustainable seas compare to these global programs? So the objective of sustainable seas is to enhance utilization of our marine resources within environmental and biological constraints. And there have been two phases. So the first phase started in 2014 and generally lasted until 2019. On the left-hand side, that's a, a picture of the cover of the uh, research plan. And you'll see that I've circled in red the, um, the date of the plan. So August 20, end of August of 2015. So phase one of the Sustainable Seas Challenge very much is a creature of think the thinking at the time in the mid-teens. That's okay, because that's where we were at the time. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. There are much more detailed presentations in the subsequent um, series of webinars that um, I would certainly recommend that you uh, turn into. But for those who might not be familiar, I just want to run through the kind of names of the programs, the component elements of the um, Sustainable Seas National Challenge. So there are five main um, programs. There's Our Seas, Valuable Seas, Tangaroa, Dynamic Seas, and Managed Seas. And along with that, there are one, two, three, four, five um, cross-program projects enabling EBM within um, New Zealand's existing legislative framework, future EBM frameworks for New Zealand, trialing EBM, vision mataranga, and communication and outreach. So how is phase one done? How has sustainable seas done in phase one? Well, it's... Um, it's achieved a lot. Uh, it's produced state-of-the-art knowledge about New Zealand's coastal and oceanic systems. For example, managing cumulative effects of multiple pressures. It's produced new management tools for marine decision makers. Again, for example, tipping points in ecological function in response to these multiple pressures. 
It's produced very strong collaborations with Maori and stakeholders to advance the concepts and understanding of EPM. Uh, it's demonstrated commitments to the Treaty of Waitangi Partnership and it has developed uh, and achieved a strong international reputation for its success. So as on the right, well done. And how does EBM or how does rather um, Sustainable Seas Phase One compare with other EBM initiatives? Well, it's consistent with global EBM approaches, at least for the time, which is sort of 2015. It has a focus on the social and societal issues and how they connect to marine ecosystems. It identifies the aspirational and goals for the systems. It has certainly developed a leading role for natural science to build the knowledge base for EBM. And it's recognized the importance of and the inclusion and, and including um, social sciences into the EBM context. But it's also, and I think quite innovatively structured differently than other global initiatives. And in particular, the development of indicators, which was a, a really you know, strong emphasis in the Canadian and the American uh, and the European um, uh, programs, wasn't a prominent focus per se for sustainable seas. It, it was there, but it was embedded into the core project. And I think this is, was a smart thing because I, my experience or uh, my experience from these other programs uh, elsewhere has been that lots of work done on indicators, but they rarely are, are used in the decision making. So somehow there's a disconnect. Maybe it's better to embed the work on indicators right into the investigation of the uh, understanding of marine systems and how those then relate to policies and legislation. Um, there has been uh, more than a natural science, a natural science focus, so inclusion of other knowledge systems, and there's been this focus on cumulative effects and tipping points. But at the same time, it's gone beyond other global initiatives. And, the, and underline here the focus on the Mataranga Mari, the inclusion of Mari views through all aspect, aspects of sustainable seas, inclusion of stakeholder consultation, involvement and development of new um, participatory, uh, participatory approaches. And it's uh, really developed a solid governance structure, multi-agency collaboration with integrated multidisciplinary aspirations. And I think this also is that that last bullet point in the bottom box is one that is a standout from many of the other global programs that we looked at in this review. So if we look at these EBM elements and the EBM steps and kind of do a, a checkbox of whether or not sustainable seas has um, achieved or at least involved many of these elements, all of them we give a check to. And on the, the right-hand side, there's an examples of some of the, the programs where these particular aspects uh, have been included. So I, I, you know, I think phase one is great. There's still some issue or not issue. There's still some work being done and kind of synthesizing it all, but we'll get to that in a minute. So now on to sustainable seeds phase two and phase two ran from pretty much 2019 as it expected to go to 2024. So it's obviously continuing. And as a subtitle to this, uh, we've put evolving the concepts of EBM from phase one. So it's a continuation. And there are five main, main programs to phase two. Understanding degradation and recovery in social ecological systems, creating value from a blue economy, addressing risk and uncertainty, and, and enhancing ecosystem-based management, all surrounded and infused and uh, interlaced with the Tangaroa program. So how does phase two compare with other EBM initiatives? Well, it represents both continuity and innovation. So it strongly builds on the outcomes and learnings from phase one, but it also has spent a lot of work and a lot of time developing new tools, new frameworks, new approaches, new models for EBM really in this coupled social and ecological space. Uh, it's got a much stronger focus on case studies and trial projects. These are, these are crucial because if we can demonstrate um, how well an ecosystem-based program management approach can work in one area, then other areas will want to, to um, join in. They'll want to see the extent to which that example can be transferred to another place in another set of situations. And also equally as crucial, there are important projects concerning the policy and legislative bases for EBM. Uh, and this is a, basically includes the groundwork of the legal basis for governments to explicitly embrace the indigenous considerations. Uh, 
But there's a leading edge as well. It's not just a continuity, uh, it's a leading edge that the sustainable seeds phase two has been able to achieve. And it goes beyond current EBM initiatives uh, that we've experienced seen elsewhere. There's a focus on implementability and economic outcomes of EBM. And it's more than simply incremental improvements to global initiatives. And I think in our mind as the members of the ISP, one of the really true uh, truly best and innovative examples of that is the um, very strong co-development of the trial projects of EBM with Mari regional governments and other levels of governments and stakeholders. And we have to recognize too that this has been made much, much more difficult with COVID than, than I think was initially envisaged. And here the kind of key terms are knowledge co-production. Um, to ensure knowledge, power, and equity is considered. And knowledge co-production represents the um, integrated uh, aspects of knowledge, power, um, and uh, equitable fairness. And it's more than just, you know, we in the natural sciences develop our knowledge, you in the social sciences develop your knowledge, you in the Maori communities develop your knowledge. Now, how do we put it all together? And the blue box at the, the second box there, I think is one of the really, their cores to this, presentation and the aspect of um, sustainable seas phase two is that it's a foundational basis and integration of the Mataranga Mari and the Mari centered outcomes is, is really, really unique in this program. Some may say it's, it's a particular um, New Zealand Aotearoa uh, viewpoint, but I think it's more, which is true, but it's more than that. I think you really have beginning to show the way and develop ideas of how to integrate these indigenous traditional local with um, Western-based natural science. Um, and so it's a recognition of traditional and particularly Maori concepts of human nature relationships and how those converge with ecosystem-based management principles. And it's developing a New Zealand marine management system that includes both Kaitiakitanga and EBM equitably. And I really, really like this figure from a, a very nice paper by Kim Maxwell Kimberly Maxwell and uh, Sean Awateri and others published just last year in Marine Policy. Because in a sense, this kind of really, for me, brings together or summarizes uh, what is being not just attempted, what's being accomplished in the Sustainable Seas Phase Two program. The idea here is that uh, a single canoe um, is, is not very stable. It's likely, you know, tippy, uh, the, the seas change gets rougher, the stability is reduced and it could tip over. But when you lash that together with a, another canoe, maybe one that's structured slightly differently, suddenly you have a lot more stability, you have a lot more resilience to uh, whether the changes in weather, um, the changes in um, uh, attitudes, trends, whatever may be coming, none of which we'll know in the future. And I just also, as a, a kind of, preview of coming attractions perhaps. This is going to be featured as one of the uh, focuses for one of the webinars in the next few weeks, I think end of March, beginning of, of April time period. But there are obviously some challenges remaining and the leadership team of the challenge are well aware of these, but it's important to note them here. Uh, that assisting the development and policies and procedures that take into account the Wakatare concepts uh, are still need to be worked out. Providing the underlying support for governance and legislation for EBM Kaitiakitanga is an ongoing challenge. And, I, and I, I've tried to, we've tried to phrase this carefully by providing the underlying support because it's not up to the sustainable seas challenge to produce these policies or to produce this legislation. It's up to them to provide the underlying rationale, science and support for others who are appropriately appointed to develop those kinds of policies and legislation. And of course, as I mentioned, the case studies are crucial to demonstrating as um, uh, to, to serving as demonstration products. And then the synthesis, how all of this is wrapped together, how is it presented to different audiences, um, which is a much bigger challenge than most people recognize in these kinds of large projects. And in the, in the end, then the bottom in blue there, um, the crucial point is to build the foundation for what happens after the conclusion of the challenge. What is the challenge's legacy? You know, you, the challenge needs to start now, needs to have started already, which they have, building the um, relationships with the management uh, groups, the regional government, the different levels of government, the policies, the legislation, the understanding, the tools, the frameworks, the toolboxes 
understanding how to use those tools and toolboxes, uh, demonstration projects, so that when the challenge ends, there is a committed user community uh, who understand what's needed and how to go about doing it in order to implement and achieve ecosystem-based management. So just to begin to wind up here, to use the uh, measures of success that Sustainable Seas has uh, published in uh, some of the various uh, reports and uh, prospectus, prospecti that they have put forward, um, um, most of them are still in progress. At the bottom, the science definitely has been, science from the challenge has been published in high quality international journals. And Maori knowledge, rights, interests, and values certainly underpin sustainable seas output. So full check on that. The others um, that research is incorporated into policy frameworks to, uh, is in progress. Tools and knowledge developed are used in decision-making frameworks is in progress. Proof of concept for an EBM approach is in progress and a vibrant blue economy is in, project, in progress. But that's fine. Um, there's still a couple of years left in this um, and kind of knowing where you're going and if you like eyes on the prize or keep an eye on the goal uh, is important. And so this is a reasonable time to be bringing up where we are and giving some assessment of what still needs to be done. So just take away, you always need to end on a conclusion it's just to remind you where we've come. So I've got three points here. The first one is that phase one fit well within the concepts and approaches of other leading global ecosystem-based management programs, particularly for the time in which they were developed. The second part is that phase, um, the Sustainable Seas National Challenge is demonstrating a globally leading role in developing something new in ecosystem-based management. And I would, uh, it's pushing the boundaries and, and particularly in integrating across all of those natural, social, Maori, traditional, legal policy concepts of marine ecosystems and management. And I, my suspicion is that the scientists and the people involved in sustainable seas at the beginning had no idea that they were going to be here doing this kind of work in the middle of phase two. Uh, there's been a, a real evolution of how this project has seen. Uh, it's, it's what it needs to do and has achieved and then moved on to the next step in developing, I think, full ecosystem-based management. And uh, so I, and I'm, I, and maybe we can talk about it in the discussion period. I'd be surprised if anybody on this project in the beginning could really know where they are now and, and where they were going at the time. But as I mentioned, of course, there are challenges remaining. There's completing the, the clear demonstration projects, the case studies, synthesizing the results, probably synthesis or syntheses for different audiences. And then ensure, a lot of work and thought needs to be put into ensuring the legacy, what happens afterwards. And Julie, with that, I will stop um, and uh, turn it back to you. I will stop sharing my screen and uh, welcome people to uh, add their questions and comments to the chat or whatever they'd like to do. Oh, thank you very much, Ian, um, and the team that put the presentation together. I think it's very in insightful uh, and, and where what we're doing sits. And, and I, for one, will put my hand up and say that um, I had no idea in 2014-15 that we would be in where we are now. Um, and hindsight's a wonderful thing, what we would have built um, if we had known what we know now then. But uh, it's been a journey for all of us, and I'm very lucky to be going on it with such a fantastic um, team of researchers. So um, we'll open up for questions. There's nothing there at the moment. Um, we've got Ing Ingrid and T. Kenny, would you like to put on your videos so that we can see you? Um, in your experience, and Ingrid, know you were involved in the Great Barrier Reef um, work. What were the most significant challenges that were faced in terms of the implementation? Thanks, Julie, for that um, question. And um, yeah, I, I wasn't directly involved, obviously, in, 19, in the 1980s in, in the process of um, establishing the Great Barrier Reef um, or the, the marine park uh, process. But what, if I can just ponder on the Indigenous stuff for a second um, as a challenge, because um, Ian's last slides were particularly um, congratulating the, the 
the New Zealand challenge on um, that component. I think in the Great Barrier Reef, the approach taken to involvement of Indigenous people um, on the coastline and, and managing uh, sea country was tricky because of the static nature of the involvement and trying to establish um, co-management in a way without having a clear um, endpoint, I guess, was a, was a challenge. So I think um, Ian highlighted that in his slide as well, that it's, it's, it's very difficult to get these processes happening and the time involved in actually making them function as they should is, is great. But then there's always um, the issue of people getting tired of being on committees and um, a limited number of people wanting to be on committees, which is the same in any community you work in. So I think that would be the first thing that comes to my mind. The, the longevity of engagement is essential, but keeping people engaged over the long term is tricky. So that's, that could be my summary there. Thanks, Ingrid. Ian, you've been involved with um, the Haida in British Columbia um, and have, have certainly been an uh, interested person involved in that. What did you see? Yeah, actually, thank, thanks, Julie. Actually, I haven't been involved with the Haida per se in the particular um, uh, program that I described. Uh, Derek Armstrong, who's part of our ISP, but, but isn't here. Um, he was quite involved on the, working with them to develop ecosystem. And Derek Armstrong is a social scientist, so he's much more concerned about the issues of knowledge power and knowledge co-production and such, and how that uh, should be worked through in the, um, in the context of, of uh, with the Haida Nation. Uh, I was, however, um, somewhat involved with um, a similar sort of um, arrangement, which took place adjacent to the um, Guaya, the Haida Gwaii area. So the central coast of British Columbia had a process of, uh, of working with First Nations, working with coastal communities uh, and working with the province of BC on um, developing a common marine management plan. And it, it was again, um, somewhat um, a, a spatial management type plan, but it was led uh, in large part by the First Nations. Now, unfortunately, that um, in Canada, that particular initiative went a long way, but because of issues which I won't get into, the federal government pulled out of that um, round table. And so that kind of hampered their ability to actually um, enact a number of the um, uh, processes that they had wanted to, but that initiative is not dead. So I'm hoping at some point that the federal government will get back into it and join the province, the coastal communities and the First Nation communities to develop some of that. So. I think, um, you know, as Ingrid mentioned, it's it gets tricky when you have multiple levels of government and multiple kind of stakeholders, multiple, and in, in our case, multiple First Nations groups, they don't speak the same language, which is something that, uh, that uh, New Zealand, um, um, uh, you know, benefits from, at least all the Maori speak uh, somewhat similar, the same language. Um, so it makes it more, more difficult in, in Canada than perhaps um, in New Zealand, at least I'm hoping. We're waiting for you to show us the way. Let's put it that way. Thanks, Ian. Um, question from Conrad Pilditch. Um, thinking about beyond 2024, um, what do you think is needed to maintain the mo momentum of the EBM projects? And what are the lessons that have been learned from overseas that would help us? I can start on that if you like, and I invite Ingrid and Pekani to, to jump in afterwards. Um, in my mind, um, I think that the, the key to that success is going to be the demonstration products pro projects. If you can show in some place that something actually works using these new processes, other people will say, me too, uh, you know, I want to do that too. So um, a focus on or a concentration on getting some demonstration products, and in particular, doing an analysis of those demonstration products. What worked, what didn't, what's transferable, what is unique to that particular place? And having an understanding of that um, will go a long way for um, in inviting or encouraging interest by other places and other parties to develop these sorts of things. Ingrid or Takani, anything to add to that? Yeah, happy to add. Um, 
Yeah, so I, the things that immediately came to my mind was having champions and um, demonstration processes, uh, projects are obviously part of that, but also in terms of um, people having champions to keep uh, pushing it. Um, having outcomes, some demonstrable outcomes of, of doing it, like here's the proof, here's the proof in the pudding, pudding if you say, um, and making it easy to communicate to people who are really busy if we're going to be able to put it into a legislative or regulatory context. So, and I'll take the example from the US there where people who are on the management councils have very little time to look at a lot of information and the, the science pitch has to be really targeted and clear and, and, and understandable. So having the process go on, there's a need that communication, um, science into policy communication is is crucial in my mind. Just three points from me. Thank you. Over to Dakan. Kia ora mai, tu tahira ka ka nui te mihi atu ki a koe he i mo kau hau ki a ki ngai ta tau hei ma taki taki ana o o korero no reira tu tahira ati na koe. Yeah, thank you. Great responses and um, excellent part. I, I think for me the the um, what's impressed me, and which might um, I guess assist with answering that question is that the the, the research projects I thought were all novel, um, innovative, uh, especially translational, um, and relevant to our situation, um, and likewise knowledge translation was incredibly and. Important, and um, I guess we could see the application, the practical application of this work, uh, which I thought was um, incredibly useful and uh, relevant. And likewise, um, and I don't think we were expecting this, but the application of this knowledge to other sectors, and especially when we're looking at the interface between uh, uh, conventional knowledge and Mātauranga uh, Māori, I think there was a lot to be learned. Uh, there in terms of the methodologies, uh, the general approaches, but again, uh, the application of this knowledge and information, its translation, and likewise, uh, being very uh, deliberate, and I guess these webinars are an example of that, in terms of uh, sharing knowledge, information, and insights. Kia ora mai. Thanks, Tikani. Um just picking up on a question that's come in um, from Catherine Short, who has also um, just made comments about um, the, the usefulness of this overview that the panel has brought for us and, and to put what we're doing in context. So, so thank you for that. Uh, so Catherine's um, question was, as the Haida Arctic and now Aotearoa New Zealand EBM are better frameworks because they have a deeper inclusion of indigenous knowledge systems. And we see that the indigenous peoples remain in the natural systems. Those systems are often in better condition. What is your sense of how current global power structures are waking up to this and enabling giving power away and empowering? Pretty long question, but um, somebody want to oh. pick that one up? I can jump in. So, so I'm um, a former government scientist, now retired, so I can speak what I want. <laughs> um, and I think that, that obviously the incorporation of uh, Indigenous and traditional and local knowledge uh, is crucial to the success, success of EBM. Um, I think without that, well, well we're, we're just, we're only understanding half the picture. You know, um, this idea of land, sea, people, uh, Matarangamari um, is, it's not the same as Western EBM, under, uh, Western science's understanding of EBM, um, and it's complementary to it. And therefore, I think the like the Wakataura um, diagram or, or idea is really important here for getting that across. Now you talk about, uh, so I think, you know, 10 years, well, not even 10 years ago, when, when phase one happened, I don't think you saw any of this or it was rare to see this uh, put out so explicitly. Power structures, um, that's obviously a huge challenge, I think, everywhere. Um, but, uh, I, you know, in many ways, those of us not in New Zealand look at New Zealand as leading the way in much of this. Um, you're uh, um, uh, 
country which develops novel ideas, you have unique situations, but much of what you've developed can be applied elsewhere. And so, you know, if there is some place that we can point to, so for example, on the West Coast of Canada, um, where the federal government may or may not be involved in some of the initiatives started by the First Nations, if we can point to success uh, in the New Zealand context, the sustainable seas context, then it's the same thing we were just talking about as a demonstration product, a, a project elsewhere. Here's something that worked. Here's why it worked. Here's the particular differences that we have in Canada compared to New Zealand. You know, what can we do to take what worked in New Zealand and apply it here? Um, and so I come back to Derek's comment about the knowledge co-production. It's not just producing knowledge, it's co-producing the knowledge with different windows that we're looking through to come to a better understanding. I don't know if that if that helped, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, answer the question that you asked. Uh, it was a very um, good question and a, a deep one, um, but that, that would be my initial thoughts. And I welcome my two fellow panelists to add their thoughts as well if they wish. Thank you, and I couldn't agree with you more. And I guess the other thing to add to, and particularly when looking at um, a number of the projects, how um, indigenous methods and Western methods were applied um, concurrently and without conflict or compromise. And that was a great outcome from my perspective uh, as well. So new, new and innovative methods and methodologies which I think the international community could uh, certainly learn from other indigenous populations as well. So, uh, we have a question. Oh, sorry, and Greg, carry on. No, just a quick one for me. I just wanted to reiterate what Ian said that we're all looking to New Zealand to show us the way, in a way. And um, that's why that's so exam and so. Um, yeah, important, um, and the project's um, so important. Um, I also just wanted to make a small comment that it's it's really challenging. I can't remember the exact phrasing of the question because it's gone, but I think that um, including all voices in, in legislation, regulation, and in EBM in particular, is, is challenging. We, we don't even do it very well in science, and we're still struggling with that. And I think that, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of... Um, areas where we're, we're hoping to work on it and we are working on it, but we haven't quite got it right. So um, it, it's not exclusive to our um, regulations and legislation, yeah, or decision-making context. So um, comment and, and ask for opinion from Tom Womack. Um, excellent presentation. Um, and is keen on your thoughts around how do we allow for EBM and delineation of particular areas to be flexible when ecosystems are expected to migrate substantially over the next century with climate change? Thinking about the paradigm that progression to legislation, et cetera, becomes less flexible in that regard. Great question. Yes, how do we? Um, I, I think there are always... And again, I'd be interested in Ingrid and Dekani's thoughts on this, but um, I think there's a, uh, how to put it, there's a fundamental uh, flaw at the core of the thinking. Uh, and that's that, um, or maybe there's a, there's a challenge that we're trying to square a round peg in a square hole sort of thing, or maybe it's the other way around. And, and that is that um, ecosystems are flexible and EBM management, and by kind of its nature, legislation tends to be place-based. So if we were able to develop uh, an ecosystem-based management process, which was able to move with the ecosystem, then we wouldn't have a problem. The problem is that the ecosystem is moving and our social communities are, are the people where people live is in a fixed location. And so in, in physical oceanography, we talk about Lagrangian and Eulerian viewpoints of, of surface cir of circulation. One is kind of a map of, of currents flowing around and the other one is a drifter that flows around. Uh, and to be honest, um, you know, if we could develop legislation which was um, not, did not have to be spatially referenced, I think we would be further ahead, but that's a big ask. I'm happy to go second on that one. Um, yeah, the whole species range shift is, is an incredibly important um, area. And um, I mean, we don't only have to deal with 
within region um, groups that are going to have an interest in this, but within country and beyond that, between um, different jurisdictions, different countries, um, and, and beyond the EZs of countries. So it's a, and it, and it, in, in the first sense, you should think it just requires adaptive management, but obviously it's a lot more complicated than this because it's not only commercially valuable species that are shifting, but it's also species like, um, spe pest species, bycatch. There's, there's so many dimensions to a species shift that it's a whole area that um, somehow we're going to have to deal with. And, and it's incredibly complicated, I would say, because of these different scales at which decisions are made and um, different integrations interest groups within those different scales as well. So, um, yeah, it's, um, I, I don't have an answer, but um, I, I just wanted to reiterate that it's such an important area of research and something that we have to deal with. So we have another question from a participant. Um, there is an argument that technically we have all the tools to enable EBM already in place. However, we lack the political will or perhaps the courage to implement them fully. In mentioned that the federal government had pulled out of the project in BC, suggesting a similar problem there. If the political will is always a problem, will we really achieve anything with the research? Before the panel comments, I'd just like to say um, what we are seeing is a, a change in p political will, I think, in New Zealand in the changes in the conversation and the changes we're seeing in government documentation that is starting to point towards the government being keen to move more to an ecosystem-based management approach. But having said that, I'll pass it over to the panel. If you don't want to go first this time, Ian, I'm happy to, but <laughs> you go. <laughs> no. <laughs> Or, or mm -hmm. can you? Go ahead, Ingrid. Uh, I, just, I was just going to have a very short um, answer to this and then um, Ian can go next to Tikani. But um, I think science diplomacy is one of those things that we have to really start thinking about um, if we want to um, get things happening in the, in the sort of political domain. And it's, it's different than communicating science and uh, knowledge brokering. Um, diplomacy is one of those things that, that we're not very good at, um, but it's one of those areas that if we want to get change in the political um, sphere that as scientists we believe is necessary, we, the, the science diplomacy is a, is a key area that we need to look at. Just look at a short comment for me. Kenny. Yeah, great question. And, uh, what I mean by great question, a difficult question to respond to, as most uh, good questions are. But I think in this particular situation and when reflecting on, um, I guess, some of the issues and challenges that uh, people are facing uh, overseas, I think one of the opportunities that we have um, in New Zealand, given, given our uh, size, is that we may be in a we can sometimes be in a better position to, I guess, um, ensure that the outcomes or the learnings from these types of initiatives um, are, I guess, that the right people um, hear these views and perspectives and that we're in a better position. It, it, it's often not fast enough uh, for others, uh, but I think when you compare our situation with that of, of um, other countries, we are certainly in a better position, as others have mentioned, to ensure that these learnings um, make its way into policy and strategy. Um, of course, uh, sometimes it doesn't, um, and there'll be frustrations and challenges, uh, but my point being that um, we have certain um, opportunities here given the size of our country that I think we should, uh, would be, um, um, would be well positioned to take advantage of. Kia ora, Ian. Kia ora, Takani. Um, yeah, I'm going to sort of riff on both of my colleagues' um, comments, which are, which are excellent. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that there's an issue of scale here. That much of what I've presented, much of what I've been thinking of needs to be kind of at the top-down national level. 
But there are in fact opportunities and there are lots of um, a number of examples of ecosystem-based management being done at much more, much smaller scales, more local scales. Uh, and in fact, in the US where I had mentioned they really don't have a, a top-down driven legislative basis for EBM, there are examples of uh, local bays, communities um, main, main, uh, developing a much more inclusive, i.e. ecosystem-based management strategy uh, for their local area without all the need for the top-down global uh, or national um, initiative. So in a sense, it's, um, you know, we can do it here. We don't need you over there to tell us what, how to do this. So I think if there were local uh, examples, local um, demonstration projects about how this is working, you can make ecosystem management a, a fait accompli without perhaps the national legislation. I, I, it lacks, I, I think there's still a need for the national legislation to provide the kind of the overarching context and to ensure that the right people are involved and that they know what their roles are. But I think a lot can be still gained by doing the local. And so you could scale up local to regional. And I, again, I would echo Takani, I think in, in New Zealand with the um, strong Maori presence and the strong Maori communities and the strong interest in Mataranga Maori and, and marine resources and um, local communities that there's a great opportunity there for doing things at the, if you like, at the ground level and not waiting for things to happen at the national level. Just, just some thoughts. Thanks, Ian. So to, to wrap up this webinar, um, I'd like to read a comment from one of our participants and then a, a final question. So this is from Murupiti Reedy. Ian, we are a small project that starts with our Ngāti Pūrō legislation that asserts our unbroken mana relationships with our moana. We too find there is slippage between our whānau practices and we have that we have practised forever and that we expect our practices from our Pākehā science contracts. So I'm totally appreciative of the global explanation and our right to assume expectations of our practices will continue. So that's from our project um, on the east coast of the North Island and the Gisborne region. And um, a final question from Nick Lewis. Um, if there were to be a single measure of success of the challenge as a process that stretches beyond the end of the funding, what would that be? Uh, maybe I'll jump in and let, let uh, my colleagues have a few moments to think. Nick, thanks. Great, great question. Um, so I think asking me to, to suggest a, a single measure of success is asking is like asking me to, su to suggest a single measure of marine ecosystem health. And, you know, I, I'm not sure they're there because there are a number of different objectives, a number of different audiences for these kinds of objectives. Um, but, but I guess, you know, to put it in a, a rather general sense, I would say if there are, is uptake of the concepts and the tools on the approaches of uh, the Sustainable Seas Challenge um, by communities and regional governments um, after the challenge is over, I think that's a success. And I think because of that, that will then snowball into, um, excuse me, broader uh, uptake and eventually, if not already, national uptake. So. And I, I kind of come back to the need for those demonstration projects uh, and the need to get a, a cadre of people who are uh, trained and understand how to do this work that can carry on without the whole superstructure of the sustainable seas behind them. Just some thoughts. So Kenny, Ingrid, your comments? Um, yeah, I'll... In, in, in addition to Ian's um, um, not so single measures, <laughs> um, I, I would like to go one sort of level higher perhaps and look at it at a, at a higher level and, and, and simply the fair distribution of the benefits of EBM, which um, Ian highlighted in his, um, in his talk. So if I had to have one single measure, I guess it's an outcome and that's the fair distribution of the benefits of EBM. Uh, thank you for providing me with extra time to think of something profound to say. <laughs> um, one single Im uh, impact, uh, uh, like the others, I don't think I, I can come up with uh, any um, single item, but, but the words that come to mind is enduring impact, uh, enduring uptake, and enduring positive change that can be traced back in some 
large or small way to this challenge. Okay, well, um, bring this to an end. And I'd like to thank very much the ISP members for the time and effort. Um, I know they all put into um, supporting end get pull the presentation together and in for presenting that I know um, it, it was a sig really significant commitment to bring this together so thank you very much um, and thank you to all those who have, it, who have attended um, really um, appreciate you being with us today and hope you will join us for the rest of the webinar series and uh, I'd like to hand over to Linda um, to complete the webinar thank you Oh, kia ora koutou anō. Um, yeah, just to reinforce the thanks um, from Julie uh, for the Independent Science Panel scorecard or read on the temperature of what we're doing has been really useful, um, both to reinforce, I guess, the evolution that the challenge has been through in its existence, um, but also to highlight the task um, ahead of us, um, the challenges and the task ahead of us, uh, particularly around learning from international examples. We're extremely grateful for the independence of thought of view and opinion you bring to the challenge. So thank you, Neida, to me, uh, kia koutou, rauranga tira. Uh, nō reira, uh, me motu a tātou nei hui i tēnei, i tēnei rā, uh, me karaki a tātou. Uh, unu hia, unu hia, ki tūru tapu a nui a tāne, ki a wātea, ki a māma te ngā kau, te eningaro, te wairua, te tīnana i te aratakatu, e rongo a ka iria, ki a ronga, ki a wātea, ai rā, ko a wātea, au, tūtū waka maua, ki a tēnā, tēnā, au mea, uie, tāikie, ki a ora koutou.